Okay, thank you very much, Terry. I trust that everyone can hear me because I can't see you nodding or waving your little hands, but um, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. I will be talking to you today about prescription and verification of bone anchor devices. Um, as Terry mentioned, I'm at the University of Alberta, but I also have a joint appointment with the Institute for Reconstructive Sciences and Medicine. Um, this institute used to be called COMPRU, and we've been involved in bone anchor devices since 1991. That was when we first um, implanted a, a Baja back in the day. Now, I came here uh, to Alberta in 2002 and have been looking at this problem pretty much uh, since then. I was naive when I first came thinking I could solve prescription and verification uh, within the first year or two and I'm still working on it and trying my best to get it get it done. Um, so I will just tell you a, a quick disclosure up front that the work you're about to see um, over at least the last three years has been encompassed by this grant from uh, Western Economic Partnership Agreement. It's through the Government of Canada and the Government of Alberta. And on that grant, Oticon Medical is an industry partner um, that contributes some funding to the, the overall grant. Now, I think I try and position myself to, um, to, to have context for anything. And this is the way I like to think of, of the problem here. We've got on one side of, of this figure, you've got research and it's happening in the lab and it's, it's very intensive. And <clears throat> on the other side, you have the reality, which is the clinic. And then you have somebody like me who's trying um, to to be what can be called a, a knowledge translator. How do we get the ideas that we're we're learning in the in the academic uh, lab environment into the clinic? And that's sort of the purpose of a of a webinar type uh, thing like we're dealing with today. So we have really what's uh, what can only be described as a knowledge to action gap. We've got things we've figured out in the lab and we have to figure out how to get that into practice. Now unfortunately I'm going to tell you some stuff today that isn't fully there yet where you can start doing it Monday morning but it's very close and I think uh, hopefully we can we can have enough excitement around some of these things that it, it, uh, it isn't that far off and you'll be able to move forward pretty soon. Most of it, however, you can get started on right away. So I'm trying to um, fill two gaps here. One is that I think clinicians in the field, um, as Terry indicated at the beginning, have been concerned that they don't know how to verify the output of devices. If you think about preferred practice guidelines and, and what we know about air conduction hearing aids, <clears throat> there is a tendency for us to need to verify um, the output of devices, and that's that's been tricky for bone anchor devices. The second gap that we have is that uh, they're concerned, people are concerned, myself included, that we don't know how to set the device for best performance and we're left to rely on manufacturer settings which you know may be great but may um, have some limitations to it. So maybe it's better to try and think of a generic prescription that isn't manufacturer specific and see if we can apply that um, to, to this knowledge to action gap. So when I think about the fundamental goal of a of a device fitting, it really is to match the auditory needs of a user to the characteristics that we know the device is capable of achieving. So it, on this graph it's very very busy but there's all kinds of things on the left hand side that are unique to the to the hearing impaired user. We have lifestyle issues, perceived handicap, the air conduction thresholds, bone conduction thresholds, transcranial attenuation, the environment in which they find themselves in. All of these things will contribute to the auditory needs of a given user. On the other side of the figure, we have the device that's under test. What are the gain and compression settings of that device supposed to be? How do we deal with the fact that the maximum power output of these devices might be slightly different? What is the frequency response that leads to optimal audibility? How do we set the volume, the programs, the feedback management, all of these things? And, and as we, we try and think of two of them, how do we get them to match up best? So that's at a very high level what we're talking about. Historically, there have been a couple approaches to hearing aid fitting that have emerged. The traditional approach, which many of you may recall, was simply to do some hearing testing, do some assessment, figure out that somebody needed a hearing device, and then use your clinical, clinical experience as well as your knowledge of what device capabilities were out there to pre-select a number of devices for a given user. Maybe you pick two or three different devices and see which one works the best. You evaluate the performance and then you choose the one you want at the end. 
Now that's the traditional approach. In the, in the last um, many years, the theoretical approach has been driving much of what we do for hearing aid fitting. And that is to assess the user's needs, similar to assessment in the traditional approach, assess the user's needs, and then apply some theoretical rationale, plus a knowledge of device capabilities. So, so some sort of prescriptive algorithm to prescribe an output, not necessarily a device, but an output that's likely most beneficial for a given user. And then we verify, rather than evaluate one device versus the next, we verify the output of a given device to make sure it's meeting the prescribed targets. At the end, then we do a validation to see that the user is doing well. And if not, then we can go back and reevaluate either the prescription or the device capabilities. And we, we, at the core of what we have is a theoretical rationale driving the prescription. So I want to talk to you about the fact that I think we're stuck a little bit with a traditional approach in bone aggregate devices where we assess somebody with some crude techniques that aren't necessarily applicable to bone anchored uh, hearing because they don't have an implant yet when we do the assessment. Then we might pre-select with our clinical judgment, a, you know, you're likely to, probably going to do well with this device or maybe you need this device. And then we evaluate how you're doing and then we just send you off on your way. We don't have a really good understanding of the output of the device on an individual basis and we don't have a good understanding of um, how to prescribe that. So I'm going to try and bring the theoretical approach to this discussion. So we'll start with assessment. Um, but before I guess before we get to the, the details of assessment it's important to, to justify that statement that a theoretical approach is necessary and these are the things you can pl pull out of the literature very easily in terms of uh, a prescriptive approach that we get improved aided speech performance we have preferred practice guidelines that that require us to do these things we have recent papers suggesting that you get better subjective outcomes as well as objective outcomes um, when you do a prescriptive approach we can actually compare devices much better if we can match them, um, if we want to do a comparison trial, if we can match them against a generic prescription. That's an important outcome because a lot of studies will just pit one technology against another with no understanding of how the thing was set in the first place. And so with a prescriptive approach, we can actually quantify audibility, which can lead to better outcome comparisons. Uh, we obviously have increased consistency in outcomes and at the end of this presentation you'll see a little bit of what I mean by that. Um, and then obviously reducing the limitations of subjective reporting is a huge aspect of prescription. So if somebody can't necessarily give you um, adequate feedback, um, a child obviously or somebody who is difficult to test, or maybe just the fact that subjective outcomes tend to not be uh, always the most accurate. So those are some justifications for this. I doubt I have to prove that to anyone listening, but I, I just thought I would. Um, one of the things that we we uh, we struggle with when we get to the assessment phase is that you're testing somebody through skin and tissue, and so I always ask this question. It's a little hard to pull you um, without uh, seeing your hands, but when you think about the pure tone average of five, one, and two. How many dB do you think you gain by going directly to the Baja abutment? Now this has been out there for many, many years, but if you ask an audience somewhere, usually most people say 10 to 15 dB, so C or D. But the answer really is we don't have a clue. So you're going to get a better threshold by going directly to the abutment, but we don't know how much on an individual basis. I'm going to show you a couple graphs to, to just justify this. On the left hand side we're looking at the frequency 2000 Hertz and, and what you see on the y-axis is acceleration level in DB so that's that's an actual physical measurement of how much a vibrator is accelerating on your head and that's your threshold acceleration on that y-axis on the x-axis we're looking at DBHL which is what you'd get on an audiogram with a B71 um, so if you're doing bone conduction at 2000 Hertz you get some dBHL value associated with that. Now what I'm showing with the two lines that intersect the y-axis and the x-axis is that you can have somebody who has a 35 dBHL audiogram bone conduction loss at 2000 Hertz who might have somewhere in the region of 78 dB acceleration level. Then you can have somebody with a 30 dB greater loss at 65 dB according to the HL audiogram whose acceleration level is only 5 dB different. 
So again, on an individual basis, very difficult to predict. The same is true on the opposite graph. You can see in the vertical plane with the ellipse that's um, in the vertical di direction, somebody with this, a 30 dB HL audiogram at 4000 Hertz might have an acceleration level around 60. The same at 30 dB HL, another individual may have somewhere up around 105 dB. So it's highly individual what you get from an HL audiogram to what you get in a real objective um, threshold measurement. So that is a problem. Then we have the skin thickness issue, which we thought would be fairly predictable, right? I mean, if you, if you imagine the skin getting thicker, you would expect that the thresholds would get worse when you're looking at the skin versus the abutment. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. If you look at this, we're looking at threshold shift between going through the skin and going directly to the abutment. And it's as a function on the x-axis of skin thickness. And what you can see, if you just look over to the, let me just grab my arrow here. If you look over to the, oops, this side of the graph, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow or not. Um, at 13 millimeters of skin thickness, we're having somebody with a, a threshold shift of only about 4 dB. Whereas somebody over here with 2 dB, or sorry, with only 2 millimeters of thickness may have a 16 dB difference in thresholds. So again, this looks like a shotgun blast, not a straight line linear um, regression. So this is a very confusing thing. And on an individual basis, we have to measure it. That's the point. Um, another graph showing roughly the same thing. We're looking at transcutaneous or through the skin versus through the abutment thresholds. And in the higher frequencies, you'll see this trend toward there being an, an increase um, or an improvement in the threshold when you go directly to the abutment. However, the error bars on this graph are 95% confidence intervals. And what that means is, sure, in this sample of, of um, subjects that we ran, maybe the average at 3000 hertz was around 13 dB. But the 95% confidence interval says that the true mean likely lies somewhere in this huge range. So it may be down here at 5, it may be up here at 20, and on an individual basis, again, we don't know. From person to person, we've got to measure it. So if I had one last recommendation to make, or a primary recommendation to make in terms of assessment, it is this. You're stuck living with some uncertainty because you have to measure thresholds before they have an abutment and we have to make a clinical decision about whether you're going to be a candidate before you have an abutment. That's tricky, but we can live with some uncertainty there. We just have to. But when you're talking about assessment in the context of a hearing aid fitting, and back to that model that I introduced at the beginning, assessment really ought to be thought of as the thresholds obtained through the abutment once you've had it installed. Okay all of the threshold and all of the super threshold information should be referenced to the abutment and not the skin covered mastoid. Okay, so in terms of the assessment piece that's a primary recommendation. So we need at minimum accurate thresholds through the abutment and we, we advocate using DB force level. Um, there's a couple different ways to do it. You saw that I was talking about acceleration before. Uh, force level allows us to compare directly to a skull simulator, which we'll get to in a few minutes. We need an estimate of loudness discomfort level. Um, we've measured this in the past, and we find that um, loudness discomfort level is actually higher than the output of the device um, that we're actually measuring. So that's why I have the next bullet, which is saying more likely the upper limit of the device under test. And we'll see why in a minute. And then perceived in real life difficulties, obviously you can't ignore that at the assessment phase that um, somebody's um, situational obligations is, I'm really sorry I didn't turn off my um, email and you're going to hear it going off the whole way through. Okay, so let's talk about prescription. So this is the point where we inject this theoretical rationale. Prescription does not mean which device am I going to select for a patient. That's obviously something we have to do, but um, at this point in time, prescription does not mean which device. So, fundamental goal of hearing aid fitting. 
I would suggest that maximizing audibility of important and usable in speech information is a critical goal. So what do I mean by usable speech information? It's not extremely valuable to amplify things that aren't going to contribute to speech understanding. And so if you think back to your um, your SII theory or your articulation index theory, the, the principle behind those um, standards is that there is certain components of speech information that are more important than others. And so what we want to do with a hearing aid fitting is maximize the audibility of those important components. And to sort of, um, there are sometimes there are critiques around this whole audibility approach to speech. And I think this quote by David Pascoe is actually very relevant. It says, although it is true that the mere detection of a sound does not ensure its recognition, it is even more true that without detection, the probabilities of correct identification are greatly diminished. So we have to figure out a way to, f to, to determine how much sound we need a device to produce, how to determine how much sound is over someone's threshold at a given frequency and then determine whether those sounds are important or not and how much weighting we have to give to them. So where do we start? We start with the auditory area. So how do we define the auditory area? I'm going to get you to think about air conduction for a minute. In air conduction hearing aids, we have the HL threshold. So we measure that either through insert earphones or maybe with TDHs, and we get um, some value in HL. Then there's a correction to get you into sound pressure level, and these are standardized corrections. So we call those the reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level corrections. You can find these in ANSI standards, ISO standards, and these will be relevant for each frequency so that if you have 0 dB HL, there will be some reference equivalent threshold sound pressure level at a given frequency, say at 1000 Hz. Then we have to add the real ear to coupler difference, which is going to convert the, the coupler SPL into the individual real ear SPL. And at the end of that, we have sound pressure level at the individual's eardrum. And that's, that becomes the basis or the threshold against which we can compare the output of a hearing aid in the person's ear. If we know the sound pressure level that they can just hear in their ear canal, and we put a hearing aid in that ear canal, we can determine how much the hearing aid is producing above an individual's threshold. So if we think about the same system in bone conduction, we have the HL value, and I put HL in quotes because um, I'm, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the software for um, both manufacturers in terms of um, testing in situ or BC direct thresholds. You get an HL value. Now I say HL because in quotes because there is no standard for direct bone conduction HL. Um, a couple attempts are out there. Uh, Hawkinson and Carlson have published one um, that gives you an estimate of HL, um, but it's not standardized. Um, equally, the RETFL or reference equivalent threshold force level is not standardized, and therefore it's in quotes. But that's the, the Hawkinson and Carlson paper exists. Um, and so it is going on in the background of both manufacturers' software in order to get you from an HL value to a force level inside of their software. The third piece on that equation is, is logically equivalent to the real ear to coupler difference. If we can determine the sound or the force level on a coupler, then there, there's reason to, to suspect that maybe there's a difference between someone's head, the way someone's head vibrates, and the way a coupler vibrates. And we call that the real, hear, real head to coupler difference. At the end of that equation, you have the force level, the output force level for a given device or a given threshold. In this case, we're talking about threshold. So if we wanted to go back to sound pressure level for a second, we would say at 2000 hertz, say you measured 40 dB on your audiogram. If you wanted to know what sound pressure level that was in an individual's ear canal, you would apply the RETSPL, 
which in this case would be 3 dB. Then you maybe measure their RECD and find at 2000 Hz that it's 5 dB. So the real ear is 5 dB greater than the coupler. And at the end of that, then, you would have 48 dB SPL in the ear canal. If we think about force, maybe we measure 30 dB in situ on the uh, manufacturer's software. Then we add a RETFL, or reference equivalent threshold force level, of 30 dB, and we subtract 2 dB for the real head to coupler difference. And what you end up with is 58 dB output force level. In other words, if you're at 2000 Hz, threshold in a manufacturer's software was around 30 dB quote unquote HL, it might actually be a 50 dB, 58 dB force level that is required for that individual to just hear. So if we knew that at 2000 Hz that you need 58 dB output force level to just hear, then we would need a hearing aid to produce more than 58 dB output force level for you to have any audibility at that frequency. Make sense? I hope so. I hope that most of you are familiar with spl -ograms because this graph will look very familiar to you. What we're looking at here is an of -ogram. So this is that auditory area that I was describing before. If you, if you look at the bottom of the graph, uh, you're looking at the 0 dB quote-unquote HL in force. So that RETFL that I was talking about on the previous slide, this is actually what the RETFL looks like. So for a given individual with no hearing loss in bone conduction, this is the force level to just stimulate 0 dB. I hope, I hope that makes sense. At the top is a measured LDL or loudness discomfort that we've done in a previous study for a group of individuals. So this is an, this is an actual sample of loudness discomfort levels for a bunch of bone anchored device users. So the difference between the bottom line the tr with the triangles and the top line with the diamonds is actually the maximum, approximately maximum auditory area for bone anchored users. So we have to fit speech somewhere into that dynamic range. But as I said earlier, there's a, a couple limitations here that we have to talk about. One is that the devices that we have available to us, I didn't include the Cordell here because that, that most people aren't using the Cordell, but it, it is actually a very effective device if somebody has that significant a hearing loss. Um, but we are including the power level ear, the, the power ear level devices from, uh, in this case, this is a BP-110, the MPO, or the maximum power output or the maximum force output of a BP-110. It's almost always lower than the LDL of an individual. So we have a decision to make. Do we use the LDL of an average group of users or of an individual user, or do we use the MPO of a device? In our approach thus far, we've been using the MPO of the device because it typically is lower than the LDL, and that will have a bearing on where, where we fit speech in the dynamic range. At the bottom end, so we've moved the top curve down. At the bottom end, any hearing loss will increase the bottom curve. So if we have somebody who has, if you look here at, at 1500 hertz, there's a 20 dB HL hearing loss. So if I was measuring in the software um, for either manufacturer and I got 20 dB HL, this is roughly what it's doing in force level. It's moving the curve up like that. Um, and then on the, at 6000 hertz, they have a 30 dB HL loss and that moves the curve up like this. So now what you can see is for a given user, and this, this is sort of the borderline candidate of who do we go with a, a non-power device or a power device, say a Ponto Pro versus a Ponto Pro Power. What we have here between the bottom and the top curve now, or I guess the middle and the top curve, is the dynamic range of hearing or the auditory area for a given individual. And so what we have to do is find a way to fit speech into this dynamic range. And that's what you're seeing here is this red curve would be the average aided speech. And you know that speech exists in around a 30 dB dynamic range. So approximately 12 dB above the LTAS and about 18 dB below. So our goal of a prescription 
is to provide aided speech to a user so that it is within their dynamic range of hearing and so that the maximum audibility is applied to the individual frequencies that matter most to speech understanding. That was a big um, sentence that basically meant to say we want to maximize the important information of speech and make sure it's audible to an individual. And so that's why um, we're trying to do this approach um, that's generic. Okay, so once we've got the auditory area defined, then we can actually map the input dynamic range of speech into the residual output of a given listener. So on the previous slide, that dynamic range is their output dynamic range available to a listener. What we want to do with a prescription is squeeze or compress the input range of speech, which may be a huge 100 dB range, um, and bring the world of sounds into a reduced dynamic range of hearing. And so that's what the prescription is doing in a nutshell. And there are several mapping type procedures out there, um, but uh, the one that we are focusing on is one that you are likely familiar with, um, which is DSL MIO. So this is based on version 5 of DSL. And my collaborator, Susan Scully, I'm sure many of you know who Susan is, uh, has been working with me over the past three years on trying to um, apply an air conduction prescriptive algorithm to a bone anchored solution. And that's actually been uh, quite a lot of fun for us to, to work on. It's not super trivial, but in fact, once you get past all of the unique aspects of bone conduction, the algorithm handles um, the mapping procedure very similarly to air conduction hearing aids. And so from that SII or articulation index perspective, we've worked backwards to make sure that all we have to do is trick the air conduction hearing aid algorithm into thinking um, the same way for bone conduction. And so we don't start from scratch in this case, we start from a well-validated prescriptive algorithm. Okay, so I'm just going to have a look here and see how I'm doing for time. In terms of requirements, um, we have a few things to think about. Obviously we need thresholds in force level as we've just described. We need the predicted or measured LDL or more likely the MPO under test. So from a clinician perspective in order to do this you have to be able to measure the thresholds and know how to convert them into force and you have to know the MPO of the device under test. That's not stuff that's easily accessible um, from within each manufacturer's software but it's not that hard to determine um, and use consistently uh, once uh, I get it out there a little more um, accessible. Now both manufacturers have these in-situ audi audiometry capabilities within their software already so that's very good for clinicians. We can just go ahead and test you with a device um, inside of their software but we have no way of measuring the real head equivalent of the device. So you can't actually just um, measure the threshold and then measure the output of the device in situ. You can't do that. What we need is a coupler that will allow us to measure what the, the device is doing when it's not on a person's head, but that will hopefully represent exactly what it's doing when it is on the person's head. So what we are going to uh, talk about here are skull simulators. And I'll get to in a bit that I've tried a whole lot of other things uh, to do this. But now uh, I'm very pleased to, to uh, share with you that, and if you don't know this already, um, Interacoustics has released something called the SKS-10, uh, which is a, a new version of a skull simulator that um, doesn't really replace the TU-1000, but it's an alternative. And the TU-1000, I'm not so sure, is even available anymore. So there is at least a skull simulator available to clinicians to purchase um, to do a lot of the things that, that we're talking about today. And so you can, you can couple this to an affinity test box right now. In this case, we're showing it coupled to um, an external speaker test box that we have in the lab, but you can, you can do this inside of an affinity system. Uh, <clears throat> You can also, if you have some clever people around you, figure out how to make this work in other systems as well. Um, just in, 
I know some people are kind of locked into uh, certain verification systems and, and I don't want people to throw their hands up in the air and say it's impossible unless it's interacoustics. I think there are, uh, there's an appetite for using this in other systems as well. Essentially what we're doing is trying to figure out what is the transform between a real head and a skull simulator. And here I'm showing uh, a version of a Verifit with a TU-1000. This is also in our lab. Um, that's what the old uh, skull simulator looks like. So um, because there may be slight differences in the real head thresholds and the force response of a skull simulator, we need to correct the difference to the coupler. Now, I'm going to tell you that that is true to an extent. In fact, in recent um, in recent weeks, I'm less pushy on this one than I was maybe if you've heard me speak in the past um, because we're getting very consistent real head to coupler differences in a larger sample of, of subjects. And so if you can't do the real head to coupler difference at this point as a clinician, I'm not so worried because we can actually correct for it pretty consistently. It's not quite, it's not nearly as variable as a real ear to coupler difference is. Uh, where even within the same individual, you know, left ear versus right ear can be quite dramatically different. The real head to coupler difference is much more predictable and it's much smaller difference than a real ear to coupler difference. So I'm less pushy on this point than I, than I used to be, but I still think it's important to understand that there is a difference. So um, I'm just going to tell you uh, before I move on from prescription that this is the way I think of, of where we are today. Each manufacturer has their own targets. So if you um, are prescribing and fitting a cochlear device, uh, I advocate that you use the in-situ thresholds within their software. And then when you, once you're done measuring the thresholds, what will happen is that it'll automatically prescribe an output for you. And that's based on something that they call cochlear Baja prescription. And they have some some intel and insight into what they think goes best for their particular platform and that has some um, some evidence to support it based on what they've determined successful. Oticon uses a modified version of what they call NAL NL1. Uh, unfortunately I don't know exactly what goes on behind the scenes in that prescription but it's the same approach for you as the clinician when you're done the in situ hearing test the programming automatically happens in the background based on Oticon's prescription. What we've been working on and talking about is a modified version of DSL for bone conduction. Our hope is that we will be able to uh, include this in both manufacturers software and future releases so that DSL is an option for clinicians and so that if you choose to verify against DSL that would be an option for you. Um, I think the the advantages of this are pretty um, pretty obvious, but we as clinicians ought to have a generic, um, you know, in, independent of, of platform um, prescription available to us um, that's based on um, well-validated outcomes in the literature. And I think that's something that I, I hear both companies being interested in as well. So that was that was me covering prescription so now we have to move on to this verification branch of this um, of this model so as you've no doubt figured out I am advocating that all hearing information so threshold as well as um, any super threshold measures as well as loudness discomfort level all of that information should be referenced to a skull simulator in force level. So you've got a consistent ref reference quantity and a consistent reference point. Equally, the output of all devices, <coughs> bone anchored devices that is, ought to be referenced to the same skull simulator. When you have both threshold or auditory information and hearing aid information referenced to the same coupler, then you can directly compare the audibility of speech across frequencies and that's the fundamental goal of this prescription and verification approach. So how did we get here? Um, we tried a lot of different things. Um, obviously I think many of us out there 
um, struggle with what to do when it comes to verifying a fitting. We want to have some outcome measure that tells us something about the gain or the audibility of speech. And so one of the approaches I assume that many people are, are still doing is to use aided sound field thresholds or an aided audiogram. So you do your fitting and then you, you connect a device and then you measure aided audiogram. I'm going to tell you that that gives you quite um, different results than the objective approach that I've been describing before. And so we'll talk about a little bit why that is the case and why I don't do aided sound field thresholds at all um, in the lab or in clinic. The second approach that we tried was well, maybe we could just use existing uh, ear canal technology, um, real ear technology that is available in most clinics today. The thinking is that if you vibrate the skull, you actually produce um, a vibration in the ear canal that can be picked up by a microphone and used as a reference point. So um, we stuck probe microphones in people's ears and we played vibrations through the abutment and we were able to measure actual um, sound pressure levels for, uh, for bone conducted signals. But there's a couple limitations uh, to using that technology and I'll explain what those are. The third approach, which is very similar to the force approach that I've been advocating throughout, is to use accelerometers on transducers. The big advantage of using accelerometers directly on a transducer is it is logically equivalent to doing in situ real ear measurements. So instead of using the whole HL plus RETSPOL plus RECD equals ear canal SPL, if you measured with a real ear microphone directly in someone's ear their threshold, then you would have exactly the equivalent of what we were doing with accelerometers. You're measuring directly what the individual's head is doing in terms of a direct mechanical quantity. Trouble with the accelerometer approach, obviously, is that none of us have accelerometers and special transducers in our clinics, and so that's not really a great approach, and that's why we've been advocating this force approach with a skull simulator. But I'm going to tell you the difference here because I think it's really important. So if you look at a 65 dB input speech um, to a hearing aid, now this is three different approaches on one graph. There was nothing different about the setting of the hearing aid in any of these approaches. It was the same hearing aid on the same patient using three different approaches. And this is actually the grouped data from a, a bunch of people. And this, this paper is available, I think this one's in IJA 2010. Um, so if you want to look it up, you can. But the, the, the bottom line here is you have to just believe me that the acceleration or AL approach is the right approach to assessing audibility. And then you, you compare the SPL, which is the ear canal uh, sound pressure level approach versus the uh, aided sound field or AS approach. And what you're looking at on the y-axis is the aided audibility of speech. So at each of these frequencies, 250, 500, 1000, 2000, and 4000 hertz, what is the aided audibility according to the approach under test? Keeping in mind that the, the device didn't change at all. So the output of the device was the same in each case. But what you're looking at is very different results for three different approaches to measuring the same problem. And that's very confusing for clinicians. <clears throat> we don't need this much variability between approaches. So if you look at AS only, which is the far right bar, you can see that at 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000 hertz, it greatly um, overestimates the audibility of speech compared to the other two approaches. Um, just looking at, at 4,000 alone, it is roughly 10 dB greater. You would assume 10 dB more audibility at 4,000 hertz than is actual reality. So, um, so that's a problem. What are the issues with the ear canal sound pressure level? Well, obviously the noise floor of the measurement microphone is a huge issue. When we talk about the acoustic signal in an ear canal from a bone conduction signal, it's very, very small. So in order for us to pick up that SPL using a microphone in the ear canal, 
it requires that you um, have a very, very sensitive measurement microphone, much more sensitive than is available in today's real ear systems. And so we're back to the same problem that we had before, which is this is not possible with existing clinical technology, and so we probably need to abandon that approach. Um, the second issue we had with the ear canal SPL was that the low frequency signals, so in speech things like vowels and consonants, low frequency um, nasals, would easily pass through the earplug into the ear canal and pick, be picked up by the measurement microphone even if they were not coming from the aided bone conduction signal. So if I'm playing a signal to you wearing a bone anchor device and I'm playing loud speech, the low frequencies would get through the earplug and be picked up by the microphone independent of whether it went through the hearing aid or not. Which means if you look back at the previous graph, this is why we see the sound pressure level approach measuring highest here at 250 hertz. Not that much speech information was going through because look at the AL approach. It's actually very hard to vibrate the skull down here at 250, so this makes sense to me. This didn't make sense, and that was why the signal was getting through the earplug into the measurement microphone, which contaminated the results in the low frequencies. I imagine some of you will take offense to, to me critiquing the aided sound field approach because, again, it is one of the only things we have available to us, but it it does have significant limitations, and I don't think that it adds a whole lot to your fit. Well, it doesn't really add anything to your verification, it still is relevant if what you're interested in is validating the softest sound a person can hear. So I'm not saying it, it has absolutely no um, value in terms of understanding the softest sound a person can hear in the aided condition. What I'm saying is it doesn't have a lot of value as a verification approach. It doesn't tell you about the gain of the hearing aid. It only allows for limited frequency resolution of the aided response. So if I test you at a thousand and two thousand hertz, a whole lot could happen with a frequency response between a thousand and two thousand hertz that doesn't show up in this test approach. It's susceptible to the noise floor of the hearing aid as well as the test room. And you'll you'll see audiograms like this where people with really good bone conduction always have worse looking aided results than they do unaided um, even with the B71 approach and so the reason that's happening is because the noise floor of the hearing aid is too high as well as possibly the room. Another issue is that it doesn't uh, provide an estimate of output limiting you, so you can't drive a bunch of signals through in an aided sound field approach and determine the MPO of the device. Maybe that's not such a huge issue with, with bone anchor devices but it is a limitation. I think number four and five are the big kickers for me. It utilizes test signals that do not simulate everyday input to the hearing aid. What we want to know about is speech. And what the aided sound field approach is going to tell us about is the, the softest warble tone you can hear in a sound booth. And if you have anything to do with a nonlinear hearing aid, which um, there are frequency regions in the, both of these manufacturers devices where things can be a little nonlinear and it does depend on your hearing loss. Once you get into nonlinear hearing aids, soft pure tones or soft warble tones may look like they have more gain because of the wide dynamic range compression than a similarly fitted linear hearing aid. And so once we get into um, soft sounds and quiet we end up with problems. And then finally if you were to test somebody on a Tuesday, their aided responses with the Baja or a bone anchor device, and then maybe you wanted to tweak a fitting and you test them again on Wednesday, the changes would have to be greater than 15 dB at all frequencies because that is the test retest variability associated with this test protocol. So you may make a change that is only 5 dB on a skull simulator. So I can easily measure a 5 dB change on a skull simulator. If I put you in a booth and try and measure that with an aided sound field threshold, even if I measure a 5 dB difference, it's not really a difference because of this test retest variability. It needs to exceed 15 dB in order for it to be valid, and that's a limitation of aided sound field approaches. Okay, the very last component of our model is the validation evaluation. Um, approach. And at this stage we're asking what outcome measures do you use to evaluate your fitting? And as you know there are many many to choose from. 
in our lab we we focus on um, uh, constant identification primarily in noise so a test called the UWO DFD um, we also use the, the words and noise test the quicksin aided loudness um, there are many many tests that that you can choose from to validate your fitting I'm not going to focus a whole lot on on those differences um, here I just want to talk a little bit about the study that's ongoing right now about prescription and verification and uh, and focus mostly on the uh, the issue of uh, speech intelligibility index so in this study we're looking at how DSL targets compare to Oticon and cochlear targets what do these current prescriptions look like and what are some validation with outcome measures so here's the design uh, as it stands right now we have 18 subjects that are through the study 10 are non power users meaning they're either using the BP100 or the Ponto Pro and then we have eight um, users through the study who are power users meaning they're either using the BP110 or the Ponto Pro Power you can see on the the right hand side of this figure that nine are primarily conductive conductive slash um, uh, mixed nine and eight and then only one with single-sided deafness I will point out that that I'm from Canada and in Canada we don't do nearly as many um, bone anchor devices for single-sided deafness as I understand happen in the US um, uh, we can talk about maybe that another another time but most of our patients fall into the conductive mixed categories and so um, there's a bit of a um, a difference in how you might approach uh, conductive mix versus SSD. So if you uh, follow along somebody who say Bob is a non-power user in this study he will come in wearing a device either a, a Ponto Pro or a BP100 and we'll prescribe him one of four conditions well each of four conditions he'll have Cochlear's device with cochlear's prescription so he'll wear a BP100 with cochlear's prescription a second condition is he'll wear a BP100 that's set to DSL another condition would be that he wears Oticon device with Oticon's prescription and then another condition would be Oticon's device with DSL once we're set up and we've um, done all four conditions then what we end up getting is this this design where we look at fit to targets and the speech intelligibility index and obviously we have other outcome measures that I'm not going to talk about today but they're part of the study ongoing um, so you're given four conditions as a user and we're asking um, how do these um, conditions fit to target and and what do the speech intelligibility index um, scores look like so the steps to achieving this are to um, first measure the in-situ hearing so both manufacturers we measure the retful plus the real head decoupler difference and if I have time at the end I'm going to show you a video of how this all happens in our software um, then we know the MPO of the device under test we've measured this and averaged it into the software that we've developed and so we have an MPO built into the software for each of uh, the devices under test this is actually built into the DSL algorithm so if you choose uh, BP110 it knows the output MPO of that device within a couple DB of what we're able to achieve with most BP110s then we have to turn all the automatics off of the devices obviously just like any other air conduction prescription when we have the automatics on that can can mess up uh, your ability to verify the devices in the test box then we measure the average speech of the manufacturer targets and then we set to DSL the best that we can so just like any other fitting we're setting a device as best we can to a set of targets or we're setting it the way the company wants you to set it according to cochlear's prescription or Oticon's prescription and then we have these four settings saved and then we begin the outcome measures in random order counterbalance for each subject this is an example of uh, just a, a picture of a Ponto Pro Power within uh, the test box uh, with a measurement happening. That's how we set the device. I will come back to that video at the end if I have time. So what do we get? Here's where it gets a little interesting. One of the primary questions we have with this whole DSL approach is are we even 
remotely close to within the realm of possibility. Because, you know, in, in the past, DSL has been uh, critiqued for providing gain that was unachievable by devices. And so in the newer versions, version 5, there's a lot of um, thinking that went into applying different rules depending on the type of subject you are. So if you're a kid in quiet, um, and if it's uh, if you're a kid in in quiet versus an adult in noise, there may be different prescriptions that are embedded. So um, we we just look towards um, whether we're in the range of possibility here as a good starting point. And what you can see is that um, they're all fairly close, but there are there are some important differences in the low and mid frequencies, especially where it looks like cochlear prescribes quite a bit more than DSL, which is the green. Cochlear is the yellow. Oticon as well in the mid to low frequencies provides a little more audibility in, in those regions. Um, and then out in the high frequencies, Oticon and uh, Oticon maybe has a slightly lower output in the high frequencies um, than DSL. So these are interesting graphs in the sense that it shows that we're within the range of possibility. If you look at the fit to targets, now this C-C -C means that this is a cochlear device set to cochlear's prescription. And what we're looking at on the x-axis is frequency and the y-axis, how much difference was there between cochlear's prescription and DSL. And you can see quite clearly in the sort of 600 to 2500 that there's quite a bit more gain being applied with cochlear's prescription than DSL would recommend. At the bottom, we're looking at a fit to targets of plus or minus 5 dB around 40%. Okay, So what happens to Cochlear's device if we then set it to DSL? Well, we can get within targets around 76% of the time. And another important thing that you notice is that the error bars got a lot smaller, meaning that clinicians can be much more consistent with prescribing an output if you're following a set target. If we look at Oticon set to Oticon's prescription, you can see again that in the mid to low frequencies they provide a bit more audibility than DSL, um, but then in, the differences are, are uh, opposite in the higher frequencies. With Oticon's prescription we get around 59% uh, within 5 or plus or minus 5 dB of targets. When we then set Oticon to DSL, we can increase that number as clinicians to around 72%. So again, more consistent fitting once we actually go to the to the DSL. In terms of speech intelligibility index, what we're looking at here is broken down between the 10 non-power users and the 8 power users. And what you can see is blue is Oticon Oticon, green is Oticon DSL, yellow is Cochlear Cochlear, and purple is Cochlear DSL. There really are no differences for non-power users between the audibility of important speech in terms of the SII. However, when you get into power users, you're looking at um, an increase in SII for both Oticon and Cochlear when you move to the DSL approach. So that's a nice trend in the proper direction. We're seeing that as we move to this prescribed approach, the SII improves for both manufacturers over their proprietary fitting algorithms, which I think is a nice um, move in the right direction and it's the direction we expected it to go. So obviously we need more data to continue to see if this is, is uh, remaining to be the case, but it's a nice promising start for this study. So I want to leave a couple minutes for questions, so I'm going to just say um, a couple conclusions. One is that we are pretty sure that we're in the right range of possibility for these um, devices using the DSL approach that we've derived. We do need to tweak some of the targets in the low frequencies. Uh, that's come out of these initial 18 subjects. We have to go back and tweak those targets. It's very important that you could see the difference between power users and non-power users, and this is the same of air conduction hearing aids. If you have a very mild hearing loss, you can be much more forgiving with your fitting than if you have a much more severe to profound hearing loss where audibility of the prescription really does start to matter, and that's true of bone anchor devices as well. Um, what is optimal? This is a debate that 
that people love to get into in the prescriptive literature. Um, I'm not advocating that there's an optimal target at every frequency. What I'm saying is that there should be a range that we ought to be achieving and striving for, and there, there does appear to be some wiggle room around about 10 dB of targets. So it, it and DSL is sort of built around that now with four different potential prescriptions depending on the type of user you are. The targets will move around with some wiggle room and that's good. And the all-important question of time, how am I going to do this? Well, this adds in our estimation five minutes to a fitting and that's just to simply take a few of these outcome, uh, sorry, a few of these uh, verification measures on a skull simulator. So it's not a very big deal and most of you I assume are fairly comfortable with real air measurement of air conduction hearing aids and so you you do this anyway. So what do you need on Monday morning? Well you need a skull simulator and I would suggest that you um, you look to uh, to get your hands on a skull simulator from Interacoustics as best you can. Uh, you need some sort of test box to verify. Um, we've obviously built our own system and written the software a um, couple engineers that work with me on this grant are Dylan Scott and Herman Lundgren, Lundgren who I couldn't do this without. Um, and as, as you probably are more interested to know, you can do a lot of what I've shown you here with Interacoustic System already in place. If you have an affinity and you get a skull simulator, you're on your way. If not, there's a few things for you to add uh, to your armamentarium on Monday morning. Finally, we are pushing now towards uh, uh, including DSL in the manufacturer software and in the verification hardware as an option for clinicians, and it's, uh, it's hopefully coming in the not-too-distant future. So I hope that that uh, gives you a good start at, as, uh, as we move forward into prescription and verification for bone-anchored devices. I'm going to pass on showing the video just because I think if there's any questions, uh, you might want to ask them now.